Hey everyone, just popping in here. I am giving you a rare bonus episode. As you may know, all the bonus episodes are found now on my Patreon, but I am still trying to catch up from my Europe trip and I'm also in New York this weekend. So I didn't really have enough time in terms of like scheduling out and interviewing people. Um, during this really tight two-week time frame. So enjoy this week's bonus episode. It is my guest lecture that I did this past Tuesday on November 7th at Florida State University. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. It's a good talk. If you hear some awkward silences, it's because the classroom's mic was not working. So enjoy. Sorry, we already took up about 10 minutes of your time already, but I'm going to try to keep this as succinct as possible. Um, of course, I am super excited. Um, Alicia, thank you again for inviting me to speak to you, your class at Florida State University. It's so nice to be back. Uh, I guess the last time I was here was in June. So um, thank you again. Again, huge honor. And I'm really excited to be speaking to your class of what I hear is a talkative class. So I'm going to try to stop at each section and pause if there are any questions at all. And of course, Alicia, feel free to uh, pop in if people have their hands up, if you have something, if you need me to kind of break things down a bit further, I will try my very best. And yeah, I encourage questions, I encourage discussion um, for all you curious minds out there uh, about sex work. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we got the thumbs up. Perfect. <laughs> I just want to introduce myself. My name is Steph Sia. I am the host of um, a podcast called Stripped by Sia, um, which is a podcast that I started about three years ago um, or more than three years ago now. And it's all about um, aiming to destigmatize sex work. So by doing that, we're, we're kind of telling stories. We're telling um, the stories and the lived experiences of many sex workers and from all different facets, from all different corners of the adult industry. And that's in a way to humanize them and also to educate people who don't really, you know, might not have a lot of exposure to sex workers or maybe they don't know what a sex worker is and whatnot so I kind of do this show kind of I do the show every single week bring on different guests to again really tr provide that transparent approach to sex work and to d demonstrate the legitimacy of our industry and our jobs so a little bit about me you're probably wondering why I do the show um, it's because I myself am a sex worker so I am a a stripper here. Um, I'm based here in Vancouver, Canada, so just up north here on the West Coast. Um, I'm also a digital content creator, so I do have an OnlyFans. I make clips and custom videos and stuff like that. Uh, many moons ago, I used to be a, a sugar baby, so we'll kind of get into that once we get into my story uh, in terms of like what that might entail, what that means. Um, and I do a bit of dabbling um on the side as a writer in terms of writing for uh, like, or sex work uh, specific articles and publications. Um, but I am not only a sex worker because um, sometimes people only see sex worker and they they only see that <laughs> they have blinders on. Um, but I do uh, participate in some vanilla work or some civilian work as well. So I am a freelance marketing consultant. Um, I work with um, youth actually so i my day kind of job like my one of my big clients um they are a huge sexual health educator here in canada and i help do a lot of the marketing operations for her and it's been amazing to be able to contribute uh to that as well again all about education and i'm also an executive director for a charity uh here which also helps benefit um, youth and trying to get like better sex, sexual health education to youth. Um, I'm also a YouTuber, which has nothing to do with any of my jobs. It's all about noodles, 
<laughs> it's something that I picked up um, as a hobby during the pandemic. And I also work in hospitality as well. So I also work at a hotel as a surfer because, again, it's really expensive to live in Vancouver. And also, um, I don't know, it's really fun getting hotel discounts. So that's just a really small nugget about who I am. And I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, but yeah, we'll kind of get into it. So um, Strip by Sia, it is my podcast and we got the thumbs up. Sorry, uh, thumbs up means we're good to go or thumbs up if we have questions. <laughs> Forgot to ask. Um, so thumbs up just means we're good to go. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So Strip by Sia, my podcast, um, you're probably wondering how it all started or maybe, or maybe you just want to know what the, the origins are. So one week, one week of working many years ago, many years ago, as in three years ago, I was working and one of my customers said to me, Uh, In a statement, I can't exactly remember the exact words anymore, but they had said to me that, you know, sex workers are are really cool. Um, They have, you know, at least the ones here in Vancouver, we have tons of followers. We're almost borderline like influencers. You have really cool stories to share and oftentimes stories that, you know, most folk don't get to hear about. And that statement really stuck with me. And I thought, Hey, yeah, you're you've got some truth to that. Like, <laughs> we are normal human beings too, and this we like this is just one aspect of our lives. Like, this is our job, and I was really inspired by that statement. So I decided I wanted to tell people's stories because, again, like a lot of our stories are told for us, um, or our voices are erased or we don't have a voice we don't have a platform so I kind of wanted to do that because I have owed a lot of my my adult years to the adult industry and to sex work so I really want to be able to try to give back to the community in some capacity and also just again to educate the masses so as I mentioned earlier the objective is to destigmatize sex work um basically one conversation at a time and uh as mentioned earlier i like to bring on different guests because the adult industry is so vast it is so like there's so many different kinds of sex work out there and i think it's really important that we um we provide um a platform for people to tell their story because sex work is work and we'll definitely get into more of that as we go on with the presentation and of course like along with my story but before we go that way I wanted to see and I always like to ask this question in terms of what is your definition of sex work and I'm, I'm really glad that I'm coming into a class where you haven't even talked about sex work yet so there's no bias there's no lens there um I'm really curious if, you know, if you want to pop the mic back on, I'm really curious to, to hear like what your views are in the, the students, especially what your views of sex work are. Like what is sex work? Let me see. Okay. Hopefully this won't be echoey. It's okay. It's a little bit like a wee bit. It's okay. We'll deal. Or if it's easier, I can also try to pop open the chat as well, too. Just let me know. Oops. (laughs) I don't know if you saw my own answer up there popping up on the screen, but (laughs) I'm just curious to hear, like, what other people's thoughts or or definitions, what, what people might think what sex work is. Okay, I see the chat. We will type in the chat. That's a great idea just to cut down on the feedback and whatnot. Um, yeah, pop it in. I would love to hear what you all think about what sex work is. And once we gather that, I can also maybe kind of go into my own definition um, in terms of what I consider or like what my own personal definition of what sex work is. So while you all type that in, I will go ahead and press this. So, and of course, my video is covering everything. But from my own definition, I like to 
consider sex work as a type of centralized service in exchange for monetary value, affluent status, or power. So that can mean a lot of different things. So that can mean, you know, actually getting cold hard cash for what it is you do. Uh, It could be something that is negotiated or arranged. Maybe you want to be paid in purses or maybe you want to be paid in a vacation or other means um, or for clout. Who knows? So it really is up to what you um, kind of arrange or negotiate um, sex work to be. So another thing I want you to think about is like who does it encompass and who do you consider uh, as a sex worker? Oh, hey, Hank, got some responses here. Um, Any form of sex, including verbal and physical, that has an exchange of money. Great. I like that answer. I do like the answer. But I will say that not everything is in exchange for money. As mentioned, um, it can be in exchange for some goods or a vacation or something else or whatever it is that you want. But yes, a lot of the times it is in exchange for money. So great great answer whoever wrote that in thank you or maybe that was a combined answer for everybody but um going back to like just getting to think like who do you consider as sex workers um for example I like to ask my mom that question like whenever I talk about sex work or I talk about my podcast I like to ask and flip it back to her because of course she's like in her late 60s and she might have a different definition of what she considers sex work to be or sex workers to be and for her the only definition is um people having sex in exchange for money and i like to try to explain to her and to educate her that that is not the only type of sex work that's out there there's so many different kinds of sex work that will go into um so and and it can come into many different forms so stuff like dancing stuff like pornography stuff like camming But even like, um, even texting can be a form of sex work as well. There's many different types of sex work and I can't name them all. (laughs) There's too many to name under the sun, but I just want to kind of um, shift your perspective or at least open and broaden your mind in terms of like what sex work is and what it can be. So in regards to this, I always think it's really important to ask how sex workers would like to be addressed, um, just because language is really, really important when you're talking to pretty much anybody. Um, just like how people have pr- preferred pronouns, it is along a similar vein, um, just because some terms have been problematic in the past, um, so people like to say like for my for my own self I prefer I like prefer to call myself a dancer I could also go with the term stripper um, I don't really like the, the the term exotic so I don't refer to myself as an exotic dancer because I think there's a lot of problematic tones that come with that but those are just a few examples there as well as the ones I have here on the screen too so full service sex worker versus escort versus provider versus prostitute versus hooker it really is not a one size fits all type of motion here. So you really have to be kind of mindful in terms of like how you are addressing sex workers and how they want to be addressed. So it, again, a couple other examples there, erotic masseuse versus body work, adult entertainer versus porn star, etc. Hopefully that makes sense for everybody. <laughs> let's move. Oh, let's move on here. So um, I'll, at least like in my other talks and lectures, a lot of people are always interested in hearing about the story. And this also goes along with my podcast as well. A lot of people are really interested in terms of origin stories. Uh, where did it start for you? How did you get involved? And unfortunately, like a lot of people are expecting um, some kind of forced uh, kind of like choice Um, But that is not the case um, in my story and not the case in a lot of people's stories that I've had and interviewed on the show. Um, So myself, I actually started off as a sugar baby and that was my entry point into sex work. Although I will say in retrospect and looking back at it now, 
when I was being a sugar baby, I actually really didn't consider sugaring as sex work. I just viewed it as, oh, I'm going on these paid dates with older men, with older gentlemen. Um, really kind of furthering and distancing, distancing myself from the sex work narrative. And I was doing that because I was, maybe I was ashamed of what I was doing. I didn't want to be lumped together with other sex workers because of all the stigma that it held. So, and I also didn't really have an understanding really when I was, what I was going into as well. So basically my entry point um, was uh, I was going through a big breakup. I had a roommate at the time and she told me, you know, you should try seeking arrangements. I know some friends that are on there. And this is kind of during the time when Tinder was just kind of blowing up back in like 2013, 2014. So I was pretty much all for it because one, I need an ego boost. Two, I was really into the idea of getting paid for going on dates with people. And three, uh, I was like into older gentlemen at the time. Was, and I did not know really what sugaring meant. Most of the time, um, when you are on these websites like Seeking Arrangement, um, you sign up as a sugar baby and you're able to look and search just like a dating profile um, for like affluent men, men with money, men with power, men with status. And I was really looking for not like <laughs> platonic arrangements and they definitely do exist um far and few but i wasn't reading between the lines and i didn't understand that this website really was um arrangements with older gentlemen with usually students um and basically there is an exchange of sex for money most of the time like the majority of the time that is what people are on the site for that is what is it is um understood for and for me back in the day as a early 20s or I guess mid 20s at this time didn't really have a full understanding or grasp uh, of what that arrangement was or what that could be and of course with my own whorephobia of you know I don't I don't want to be part of this I don't want to be seen as an escort or a prostitute I had my own internal struggle of what this type of work was and at that point I honestly didn't really consider it as work so I was doing that for a few years um, again kind of around the same time when I was beginning to exit out of that I began pole dancing which led to me um, starting to strip as well and become a dancer and that for me is something I still do to this day um, it's very performative it's very freeing it's very artistic it's fun it's creative uh, I've always really enjoyed that kind of work and um, and then yeah that also led to some of my work as a digital content creator as well for the past few years and going into the present and a lot of this work kind of overlaps as well so that's kind of like my own experience in sex work. I guess I've been in sex work for almost a decade, which is mind boggling to me, but I've definitely learned a lot um, since then. And it's it's been really eye opening, I would say, um, just in terms of like some of these questions that I have below here, like how do we view sex workers and what about privilege? What about like who's being marginalized? Um, and what about labor? What about the labor is a huge thing that um, that we talk about in sex work in terms of like labor exploitation, uh, labor laws, um, which we'll get into a little bit later on in the presentation. And I also began to really think about like the power exchange uh, between clients, between sex workers, people that are not in the industry as well, um, and even within our own community. And again, with the whole notion that sex workers work. So that's just a little bit about me. I'm not going to go further into detail about that. But um, were there any questions at all? Oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> were there any questions and a question just popped up? Um, why did you stop being a sugar baby? 
That is a great question. I stopped being a sugar baby because I felt at that point in my life, I actually was trying to step away from that work. Um, I really wanted to focus on finding a relationship, like a romantic relationship. And I felt like I couldn't do that when I was a sugar baby. I I was in a living situation with with my ex-sugar daddy. So it was really pretty much impossible for me to have any other type of relationships outside of that. Um, So I really had to set that boundary and get out of it. Um, And also, I personally just didn't want to do any kind of full service sex work anymore. And and that's fine. You can you can always change your mind. So that's kind of the reason why I got out of that particular part of sex work. Um, Another question here. In what ways has sex work impacted your life? So much, (laughs) so much. I mean, I started a show based on sex work. Um, It also led me to find my fiance, who I'm going to be getting married to next year, which is really exciting. He's a former client of mine. Um, Obviously, monetarily and financially, sex work has been really great and has saved my butt a bunch of times for example when i lost all of my jobs that you saw earlier in my vanilla life um the only thing that i had left was sex work and my only fans basically that was the only kind of job that i was doing at the time so i was really really thankful for that i was really lucky to have like um some fans that that were happy enough to support me during that time so because that was really difficult I had never not been working so that was um a very very interesting time for sure and in a way that has greatly impacted me as well um as social workers how can we help destigmatize sex work I love that question I love that question because I love questions in terms of like how can we help And there's so many ways that you can. Um, If you consume porn, make sure you're paying for porn. If you go to strip clubs or you you subscribe to any of your creators online, be sure to tip them, subscribe to them. Um, There are many, many organizations, like nonprofit organizations that help benefit sex workers as well. So I sit on the board for two nonprofit organizations here in British Columbia, where I am in Vancouver, Canada, um, because I wanted to be a bit more involved uh, with my work here. Um, And for that, like, you don't even have to, you don't have to sit on the board to get involved, but you can donate to um, the organizations with either like monetarily a lot of times there are call outs for donations for things that they need um because a lot of the times sometimes they are um involved or affiliated with um shelters of some sort for survival or street-based sex workers so they're always looking for say jackets um toiletries um feminine hygiene product products and and other things as well makeup clothes shoes and whatnot so those re- those are ways you can get involved um i would also say pay attention to things that might be happening in your country in regards to sex work and what kind of causes are happening right now so for example where i live in canada um there has been a challenge to um the charter of rights and freedoms and how that impacts sex workers and how that we're not able to live freely um because it infringes on one of our charters and rights and freedoms so things like that um of course you're in the states so you might want to pay attention more so to any kind of legislation or laws that might impact the lives of sex workers so yeah those are just a few things that i can think of at the top of my head and also (laughs) considering the time constraints for today um what are business costs that you have um is it hard to justify them as a business cost for tax purposes Oh, no, business costs are great. Um, Sex workers are seen and viewed as independent contractors. So that is how we treat ourselves and like we treat ourselves as as a quote unquote business. So there are a lot of things that we can write off, which is really helpful. So if there's anything that you can think of in terms of like 
Um, if you are your own contractor, your own, you are your own business or consultant, there a lot of the things are very similar in terms of what you can write off. Like I can write off a portion of my home, uh, my car to get me to and from work, um, some certain outfits uh, that I wear at work, um, some makeup that I wear for work specifically, um, stuff like that. And um, it's... It, I, I wouldn't say it's hard to justify them. I knock on wood. I've personally never had any problems. It's just it's just filing your taxes like as you would with any other independent business. But great questions. A lot of people have questions about that in terms of like, do you pay your taxes? And the answer to that is yes, um, <laughs> which there are many benefits to do that as well. So um, oh, I missed I missed one. I'm sorry. Um, how has sex work affected your own personal intimate relationships? Uh, jealousy question mark mistrust question mark. Yeah, um, I I would say maybe earlier on when I was in my sugar baby um, like phase, I guess in sex work, um, it, it it impacted it differently because again I was in a spe- like a very specific like living situation with my old sugar daddy so that made dating to be uh difficult or and I felt like I had to hide everything so I I I didn't want to do that anymore I just wanted to be upfront and honest from the get-go and that's why I stopped doing that personally um from I guess the past few years that's when I really started to be more forthright about my job and I think that's really important, but also coming from a place of privilege because I understand that not everyone has the opportunity to be face out um, or also even the privilege of using their real name. Usually people use an alias as well. So I do recognize that I come from a place of privilege for this. And um, I've always just wanted to be honest about what I do and I don't know for for myself um some people have had a problem with it or they have been accepting of it initially but then later on uh, when the strings start to unravel then it becomes a problem and then that is always a reason you doing sex work or you dancing is always a reason as to why we break up which has been really really annoying and challenging but again luckily I met my now fiance through sex work. So that has been so nice that we didn't have to go through the whole conversation about like, oh yeah, like by the way, I'm a sex worker and having that whole uh, conversation because that can be really challenging and really anxiety inducing at times, especially um, for the relationships I have had in the past. So yes, all great questions here. Thank you so much. And they all just went off like that were there any other questions um in regards to that specific piece or should i should i move on and if there are more questions feel yes thank you if there are more questions feel free to pop into the chat whenever and i will do my best to answer (laughs) move on of course in a a nice way i I do understand that thanks alicia (laughs) So I know that there's probably about 20 minutes left for me talking. So I'm going to go ahead and try to zoom past the next few things, next few slides. Um, So this is always an interesting talking piece uh, for when I bring it up in any of my guest lectures. And I talk about the hierarchy. And if you can't see this, actually everyone can see this, right? (laughs) It's a a triangle, top-down approach. Um, But basically, it is a hierarchy among sex workers where some sex work is viewed as above or better than other forms of sex work. And this one that I specifically had here, this is just one that comes to mind, but there are many different other types of the hierarchy that are parents as well. Some people put sugar babies at the top. Some people put strippers at the top because there's no contact. So it really just depends um, who's writing it but basically this is problematic this whole thing is problematic it's still apparent to this day and it's, it is really rampant within our own community which i find to be really disappointing and um because there shouldn't be any kind of hierarchy there shouldn't be um anyone thinking that you know i'm better than you or i 
have more class than you a lot of that time that conversation goes back to that and I just don't stand by it and again like there are so many different kinds that if you google hierarchy you'll see different um, forms pop up too but um, yes it is a, a challenge that we have ourselves that we face within our own community and I want to bring that up too because um, sometimes when I do have my talk people think that sex workers are all you know on the same page and, and definitely not a lot of the times we are we not a lot of the times we are sometimes and then sometimes we are not so I just want to bring that up um, of course I think a lot of this might be um, obvious um, in terms of like isms injustices and intersectionalities so because sex workers are a marginalized group of people of course we are subjected to racism fetishization classism ableism gender discrimination ageism and violence just to name a few um, anytime you have a marginalized group they might be subject to one of these a few of these all of these um, it happens. So I just want to bring that up, but I think this is something that might be, might be obvious to some, um, definitely obvious to those who are in the community, but maybe not so obvious to those who are not, who are not in it. Um, this is also a really important piece I find, um, within this lecture too, in terms of, um, sex work being a labor issue and, oh, hang on, I've got a question. Um, what do you do to ensure your safety? So there are many things that you can do to ensure your safety, um, depending on the type of sex work you do. But one of them is working with uh, an alias or a, a performer name so people can't stalk you because that also happens sometimes as well. Or people might try to find you and out you if you are not um, an out sex worker, which can have obviously many, many different repercussions um you know if, if say your family finds out or your work finds out or friends and family those can be detrimental so some people use aliases um some people in terms of like say camming for example um you could actually take off the location or block specific locations example I live in Vancouver, Canada. I can block um, viewers from Vancouver, Canada to not enter my cam room in case, you know, you didn't want like certain family or certain friends or people within your circle to find out. Um, That's another way to ensure safety. Um, conducting background checks if you have access to that. Um, there are many client um, and photographer uh, blacklists uh, that are out there that is circulating within our community to help keep our community safe. Um, people, um, if you are doing or if you are participating in full service sex work, um, you can also ask for a deposit, ask uh, specific questions for, you know, people to, to fill out those forms. That can help um, kind of filter out some of the quote unquote questionable people questionable people as well. Um when enough possible, if there's any in person sessions that I used to do, um asking if I can bring a buddy or a friend, um, or just like knowing that like, hey, like this person is going to be close by. Um, those are just a few things that I can think of at the top of my head too. Um that I have personally used or like my peers have used as well. So those are a few things that you can do. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you for the question, by the way. Um, and of course, more questions. If, if you like, feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, we were talking about a uh, labor issue or if we're going to go into a question. Um, how do you respond to people? Uh, how do you respond to people who challenge your identifying as marginalized based on your choosing to do sex work? Oh, that's a really interesting question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, can you give me a bit more context? Uh, like um, in terms of people are not viewing this work as uh, like not like people not considering this as being a marginalized group because of my choice to do sex work. Is that kind of where you're asking or where you're coming from? Um, but for me, like if I... if Oh, for example, if a black person saying they don't choose to be black. Oh, 
that's really interesting. Oh, gosh. I don't know. Anytime people challenge or, you know, might not agree with me uh, for certain situations, I like to always ask um, why or I like to um, try to further educate them with facts, (laughs) with facts. And I also want to ask, like, do they actually have any lived experience either? Because at the end of the day, the sex workers are the experts. Um, A lot of the times we are not... um, consulted for any type of laws any type of policies um pretty much anything society doesn't view sex work as work a lot of people don't view sex work as legitimate work but and as and we're treated as such so for me that is definitely a marker of marginalization so that is potentially like a a way i would answer um i haven't had any people challenge me um, but this question has really kind of opened my eyes a little bit too in terms of like how I would answer, but hopefully that gives you a bit of insight. For me, I always like to try to come back with an educative response as opposed to a, re- a reactive response. Um, so are you saying that sex workers are marginalized because of oppressive laws in society? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely say, um, yeah, that's, to sum it up, Alicia, yes, that is perfect. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm just like, what am I trying to say? Correct. Um, lots of oppressive laws that don't enable us to live, work, play, exist. But um, I could go on. But let's continue with the, con- <laughs> the presentation for now. I know we have a little bit of time left. We'll quickly go into it being a labor issue. Um, And we kind of went into this in in terms of like safety parameters. So thank you for that question there. Um, Yeah, setting boundaries for yourself. I forgot to mention that. That's a huge thing. Huge, huge thing that I didn't have when I was a sugar baby. I didn't know what boundaries were. I didn't know how to say no. I was often tempted by money or more money. If you did this, I'll give you uh, $300 more. So... Um, and I don't know if that maybe just comes with experience too. Um, I was kind of like late when it came into sugaring, um, when it came to sex work. So I just feel like the older I've gotten, the more I kind of put my foot down in terms of like, I do not want to do this. I'm not comfortable doing this. Do not ask me to do this. I do not offer this service. So you can always say no. Um, yeah, quickly going into exploitive working conditions. So, for example, my work as a stripper, there's always a, a mix up, or mix up, quote unquote, in terms of um, different the differentiation between independent contracting and being an employee. Um, sometimes strip clubs like to demand that you be at the club at a certain time, wearing certain types of clothes. Um, when that would entail more so on uh, people who are employees because as independent contractors, you are responsible for setting your own hours. Um, you can also set your own rates um, and you have that degree of flexibility. And a lot of the times um, clubs will require you to check in at a certain time or be at a certain time um, in a certain club and whatnot. So that can be really problematic not to mention some pay cuts on some of the paychecks that we get. Um, obviously, some of the, the abuse that goes on from clients, um, employees as well. You censorship on digital platforms. So if you ever heard of the term shadow band, or if you try to type in a, like a username, it's not popping up until you type in the whole thing that users typically shadow ban and you won't be able to see a lot of their posts. Um, and stolen content, putting on tube sites, um, which the sex worker will not get paid for. So lots of stolen content going on uh, online as well, circulating the internet. So do not participate in that. And this is why you pay for pay for your sex or you pay for um, pay for your porn. Um, okay, we're almost at the end. <laughs> we're almost at the end. I keep looking at the time here. Um, so you haven't talked about this in class yet, but it is something that um, would greatly affect you as Americans uh, listening in to this lecture, Um, the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act, that is a big thing that came into light in 2018 under the Trump administration. And basically, it was an effort to combat 
sex trafficking, human trafficking. Um, but what happened there um, in an effort to protect protect people, exploited persons, um, sites like Backpage were taken off, any kind of personals, um, Craigslist, stuff like that. They were actually taken down. But unfortunately, sex workers, consenting sex workers, were being conflated with exploited persons. And what I mean by that is, you know, people who are victims of like sex trafficking, human trafficking, they're not one and the same. They're not the same as a sex worker. And unfortunately, a lot of our industry was impacted by those laws um, because you can now no longer advertise your work. It pushes um, sex work further underground, uh, less background checks, like less filtering and stuff like that. So that is still going on to this day. Um, you know, it has been really problematic. Even here in Canada, we have um, a lot that's kind of similar to that as well. Again, um, further further endangering sex workers um, by, again, pushing that work underground, which, which isn't a great thing and it isn't a great position to be in. Um, some specific examples where sex workers have been impacted is um, like police raids. Um, we could also like sex workers being denied bank accounts, um, sex workers getting evicted because of their jobs, stuff like that. Don't have enough time to go into all of it, but those are just um, a couple of things that you might want to pay attention to. And I'm sure Alicia is going to be going more into detail about that at some point <laughs> in the course curriculum. And then lastly, and this is a new slide that I kind of added in, um, Alicia, if you're like, oh, this looks different. Um, I really wanted to kind of quickly go into some differences here in terms of like, what do sex workers want? And a lot of the times you hear decriminalization, you hear legalization, and those words get jumbled up and confused a lot. So I just want to quickly <laughs> go into um, a really, really brief Spark Notes version of what decrim is. Uh, so full decrim is what um, most sex workers want and I myself also would like to see. So that involves the removal of criminal provisions against sex work. So countries like New Zealand have decriminalization. Belgium is newly decriminalized as well uh, back in March. So we're trying to, at least in Canada, that is also something that we're fighting for, although um, New Zealand isn't fully, fully decrim because they're still requiring the use of condoms for their sex workers. Um, so, but Canada specifically, yeah, we're trying to fight for something similar to a decrim model. Um, legalization um, involves regulation of where legal sex work may occur, when it may happen, and how it might take place. So, uh, legal sex work is apparent in Nevada, actually not in Las Vegas, but in other areas in Nevada where you can go to licensed brothels and um, it, the basically how the workers are set up there, there there's specific um, times that they have to get up, specific ways that they have to conduct their business and whatnot. And then lastly, uh, the Nordic model is something that is found in Canada. Uh, we have France. We also have Norway, Sweden. And this model uh, criminalizes the purchase of sex, but legalize, legalizes uh, the selling of it. Uh, but that's also a problematic model. And, and a lot of research has is also backed, um, say, uh, but backs us up saying that is it actually doesn't work. Um, cause again, um, sex worker is again being pushed further underground, just like we were talking with, um, Sesta Fosta as well. So yeah, not, not the best model that's out there. Um, but I just kind of wanted to quickly go into the, <laughs> the different kind of definitions for these terms because a lot of the times they get confused. So yeah, um, I guess we have five five-ish minutes left um 
I wanted to see if there were any other remaining questions. I kind of, I know we kind of zoomed past the last few slides, but I think um, those important, like they were still really important to bring up. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for the presentation today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Were there any other questions or curiosities that I can, you know, help answer or at least provide some insight? towards I'd, I'd be happy to answer you guys were doing so great earlier with the with the questions so thank you really great questions too by the way have you done any dom sub work i have i have uh, mostly on the doming side but i've also played sub as well which was also a really interesting role reversal experience for me and yeah it was it was quite the experience, actually. I, I really enjoyed both playing both sides, for sure. So many great questions. <laughs> and of course, if you didn't, if you wanted to ask me questions in private as well, I almost forget to put my handles on here as well, but I'll quickly type it in. Um, I am available on Instagram, Twitter with this handle here. Um, I answer all the DMs, I answer all the comments respectfully, <laughs> respectful comments. And um, I'd be happy to answer any kind of questions that you might have that you maybe didn't want to ask here or if you wanted to ask in private because sometimes this can be a private issue as well. So, uh, oh yeah, great question. This always comes up every class. Does your family know that you do sex work? Uh, to a degree, yes. Like my six, my sister knows. I've been always like honest with her. My brother kind of knows too, but we're not super close. Um, my dad, I'm pretty sure he knows. We kind of had a conversation a few years ago, although not explicitly addressing it. Um, and my mom does not know. She's very, very Catholic, um, even though I've been super open about the podcast and I've tried to have conversations, but sometimes I feel there are some situations you just have to assess. And this is a situation where I'm like, mm, I'd rather not go there. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's and that's totally fine, too. Do you do any sort of training for a person wanting to get into the profession? I do. Yes, I do. And this is another way that you could actually help sex workers too. If you are a person that is wanting to get into sex work, or if you're looking, I've like if you're looking to um, gain more resources and gain more insight, yes, um, you can ask a sex worker, um, and we usually do some kind of consultation. So myself, I do some training. I provide some brief overview and usually that's done for like X amount of dollars. I think it's really important that you compensate sex workers um, for their time because time is very valuable and um, it is part of our job as well. So and even if you're... Um, even if you're studying and you're doing your PhD or your master's and you're consulting with sex workers, always important to try to provide an honorarium to them or compensate them in some way that is appropriate. So um, when you are communicating with sex workers, try to keep that in mind. Otherwise, you know, you actually probably won't even get a response <laughs> most of the time. But again, I'm always happy to answer any questions or if you need a bit more guidance, I'm always happy to help as well so feel free to reach out and i'd be happy to send you in the right direction or uh yeah what is your favorite job as a sex worker they're all great and, and you'll find that you know if you talk to more sex workers too a lot of us actually dabble in many different forms of sex work um i love stripping because i'm a really creative person i love putting on a good show i love performing it's just kind of in my blood. Uh, I really love that. But I also love um, the flexibility of being a content creator. Um, I love kind of when clients come to me with their specific fantasies or specific customs that they want to bring to life. And the fact that they pick me and like have a very specific vision is, again, very creative for me and also really fun. And once you get like... Um, once you send the video or whatnot and getting that feedback and the commentary on it, it's just really, really rewarding. So I am personally loving a lot of that. Um, and maybe soon I might like camming because I'll be starting to do a bit of cam work as well uh, starting at the end of the month. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> 
And yeah, I mean, those are just some avenues that I really like to do. Also, some fetish work is, is really, really cool, too, as well. Um, but yeah, I love it all. I love it all. Like, for me specifically, the community is like the best thing about the sex work, about sex work in general. There's this like unspoken camaraderie and just a unity among us, <laughs> or at least on Twitter, it feels like it, it is. But um, yeah, just... Uh, it's a really great sense of belonging, I want to say. And yeah, went off on a tangent on there. But yes, those are the few areas of sex work that I do like. Any other questions? I know that it's been an hour and I think that's the time slot I had here today. But um, yeah, I guess we'll just wait for a minute. And if you had any more questions, again, feel free to reach out. I am available always on the phone, always on the laptop. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. I super appreciate it. And it was really great speaking to you all. And um, I'm sorry that I was a little bit late on today's lecture, but i um, really happy to be speaking in front of a really keen group of students. Thank you. You're listening to Stripped by Sia. Hosted, produced, and edited by Steph Sia. Music by Ted D. Graphic design by Maria Bellantarama. And photography by Ian Dabrin.